The most rigorous scientific study of dream psi ever took place at the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Over the course of several years, psychologists Montague Ullman and Stanley Krippner ran hundreds of in-house and at-home dream sessions with thousands of volunteers. Experiments usually involved trying to predict random images chosen by computer and displayed overnight in a locked room at the dream lab. Each day, Volunteers attempted to dream of tomorrow's picture, then recorded their impressions for Ullman and Krippner to cross-check. In 2003, when British psychologists Simon Sherwood and Chris Rowe performed a meta-analysis of all the Maimonides' dream psi results, they found that the overall hit rate was associated with odds against chance of 22 billion to 1. Michael Talbot wrote, In his work at the Dream Laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center, Montague Ullman, along with psychologist Stanley Krippner and researcher Charles Onerton, produced compelling evidence that accurate precognitive information can also be obtained in dreams. In their study, volunteers were asked to spend eight consecutive nights at the sleep laboratory, and each night they were asked to try to dream about a picture that would be chosen at random the next day and shown to them. Ullman and his colleagues hoped to get one success out of eight, but found that some subjects could score as many as five hits out of eight. For example, after waking, one volunteer said that he had dreamed of a large concrete building from which a patient was trying to escape. The patient had a white coat on like a doctor's coat and had gotten only as far as the archway. The painting chosen at random the next day turned out to be Van Gogh's Hospital Corridor at St. Remy, a watercolor depicting a lone patient standing at the end of a bleak and massive hallway, exiting through a door beneath an archway. Other evidence, such as psychic forced choice experiments, also supports this idea that we can see into the future. These entail having participants guess the outcome of future events with calculable possibilities, like what playing card will turn up, or what dice number will roll. In 1989, the Maimonides Center's Charles Onerton and Diane Ferrari published a meta-analysis of all forced-choice precognition experiments conducted since 1935. They found 309 studies, with 50,000 participants, totaling 2 million trials, where the time between prediction and event ranged from milliseconds to a year. The results were surprisingly positive, with odds against chance of 10 million billion billion to 1. One of the most convincing and astonishing proofs of precognition was discovered when University of Amsterdam's Dr. Dick Bierman hooked several poker players to electrodermal instruments to test learned responses in gambling addicts. He found that they all registered rapid changes in electrodermal activity just before being handed their cards. Not only this, but the differences in EDA corresponded with the type of cards being drawn. When about to receive a bad hand, Participants showed physiological activity, indicating a heightened fight-or-flight response. When about to receive a favorable hand, their EDA calmed towards a relaxation response. This indicates that on a subconscious physiological level, somehow we already know the future. Building on Bierman's work, Dean Radin also hooked volunteers up to electrodermal and other physiological instruments, heart rate, blood pressure, skin conductivity, etc., to test for recordable physical effects of anticipating future stimuli. In his experiment, volunteers would click a mouse button, wait five seconds, view a random picture displayed on their monitor for three seconds, then watch as the screen went blank for ten seconds and began again. The images randomly shown were either tranquil photos such as landscapes and nature scenes, or disturbing photos such as autopsies and erotica. Lynn McTaggart wrote, As expected, the participant's body would calm down immediately after he or she observed the tranquil scenes and became aroused after being confronted by the erotic or disturbing. Naturally, study participants recorded the largest response once they'd seen the photos. However, what Radin discovered was that his subjects were also anticipating what they were about to see, registering physiological responses before they'd seen the photo. As if trying to brace themselves, their responses were highest before they saw an image that was disturbing. Blood pressure would drop in the extremities about a second before the image was flashed. Dean Radin wrote, 
The idea of presentiment assumes that we are constantly and unconsciously scanning our future and preparing to respond to it. If this is true, then whenever our future involves an emotional response, we'd predict that our nervous system would become aroused before the emotional picture appears. As expected, skin conductance reacted two to three seconds after the presentation of an emotional stimulus, and the expected differences between the calm and emotional responses were clearly evident. But the presentiment effect, which was predicted to occur before the stimulus, was also observed. The skin conductance levels were virtually identical before the button press, but as soon as the button was pressed, they began to diverge in accordance with the future stimulus. Nobel laureate Carrie Mullis had the opportunity to participate in Dean Radin's presentiment experiment and was quite impressed with the results. He went on National Public Radio's May 1999 Science Friday program afterwards, stating, I could see about three seconds into the future. It's spooky. You sit there and watch this little trace, and about three seconds, on average, before the picture comes on, you have a little response in your skin conductivity, which is the same direction that a large response occurs after you see the picture. Some pictures make you have a rise in conductivity, some make you have a fall. He's done that over and over again with people. That, with me, is on the edge of physics itself, with time. There's something funny about time that we don't understand, because you shouldn't be able to do that. In 2004, psychophysiologist Roland McCready replicated Bierman and Radin's experiments and published his results in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. With odds against chance of a thousand to one, he found that heart rate significantly slowed before future disturbing pictures, and that the brain responded differently before the two different types of stimuli. Dean Radin wrote, Lest we forget what's going on in this experiment, it's useful to be reminded what these results mean. The brains of both men and women were activated in specific areas before erotic pictures appeared, even though no one knew in advance that those pictures were about to be selected. In other words, the brain is responding to future events. Given the controversial nature of this claim, Bierman discussed in detail alternative explanations for these results. He concluded that the fMRI results were valid and in agreement with the other studies based on skin conductance and heart and brain measures. When you step back from the details of these studies, what you find is a spectacular body of converging evidence indicating that our understanding of time is seriously incomplete. These studies mean that some aspect of our minds can perceive the future, not infer the future or anticipate the future or figure out the future, but actually perceive it. In ordinary states of consciousness and without the aid of technology, most people are able to remember the past but not the future. This has led to the philosophical idea of an arrow of time, shooting from past to future with us riding along the present. In altered states of consciousness or with the aid of technology, however, many people, myself included, have been able to experience and remember future events in detail. Perhaps then, it is more likely that time, as our ancient ancestors believed, is cyclic and infinite, not straight and finite. It seems that ultimately, our consciousness exists outside of this time-space-matter explicate hologram, and therefore, under the right conditions, has the ability to access and experience anything in the implicate. Physicist David Bohm concurred and wrote that, When people dream of accidents correctly and do not take the plane or ship, it is not the actual future that they were seeing. It was merely something in the present which is implicate and moving toward making that future. In fact, the future they saw differed from the actual future because they altered it. Therefore, I think it's more plausible to say that if these phenomena exist, there's an anticipation of the future in the implicate order in the present. As they used to say, coming events cast their shadows in the present. Their shadows are being cast deep in the implicate order. Michael Talbot wrote, Such incidents strongly suggest that the future is not set, but is plastic and can be changed. But this view also brings with it a problem. If the future is still in a state of flux, what is Croisset tapping into when he describes the individual who will sit down in a particular chair 17 days hence? How can the future both exist and not exist? Loy provides a possible answer. He believes that reality is a giant hologram, and in it the past, present, and future are indeed fixed, at least up to a point. The rub is that it is not the only hologram. 
There are many such holographic entities floating in the timeless and spaceless waters of the Implicate, jostling and swimming around one another like so many amoebas. Such holographic entities could also be visualized as parallel worlds or parallel universes, says Loy. Thus, the future of any given holographic universe is predetermined, and when a person has a precognitive glimpse of the future, they are tuning into the future of that particular hologram only. But like amoebas, these holograms also occasionally swallow and engulf each other, melding and bifurcating like the protoplasmic globs of energy that they really are. Bohm's and Loy's descriptions seem to be two different ways of trying to express the same thing, a view of the future as a hologram that is substantive enough for us to perceive it, but malleable enough to be susceptible to change. Others have used still different words to sum up what appears to be the same basic thought. Cordero describes the future as a hurricane that is beginning to form and gather momentum, becoming more concrete and unavoidable as it approaches. Ingo Swan, a gifted psychic who has produced impressive results in various studies, including Putoff and Targ's remote viewing research, speaks of the future as composed of crystallizing possibilities. The Hawaiian kahunas, widely esteemed for their precognitive powers, also speak of the future as fluid but in the process of crystallizing, and believe that great world events are crystallized furthest in advance, as are the most important events in a person's life, such as marriage, accidents, and death. Dr. David Hawkins wrote, Time, then, is much like a hologram that already stands complete. It's a subjective sensory effect of a progressively moving point of view. There's no beginning or end to a hologram. It's already everywhere complete. In fact, the appearance of being unfinished is part of its completeness. Even the phenomenon of unfoldment itself reflects a limited point of view. There is no enfolded and unfolded universe, only a becoming awareness. Our perception of events happening in time is analogous to a traveler watching the landscape unfold before him. But to say that the landscape unfolds before the traveler is merely a figure of speech. Nothing is actually unfolding. Nothing is actually becoming manifest. There's only the progression of awareness. In fact, this is a holographic universe. Each point of view reflects a position that's defined by the viewer's unique level of consciousness. A hologram, we might say, is in and of itself a process. There's nothing fixed in a three-dimensional hologram. And what then of a four-dimensional hologram? It would include all possible instances of itself simultaneously. To change seems to be to move through time. But if time itself is transcended, then there's no such thing as sequence. If all is now, there's nothing to follow from here to there.